the bus stops these days. Every hospital wants to tell you that they are the greatest. Um, these technologies allow us to focus radiation beams more specifically on the cancer, leave alone the normal tissue, so you actually pack more wallop to the cancer and avoid normal tissue. Side effects are much lesser. Efficacy is much more these days. With the IGRT kind of technologies, remember the lung moves. People can't hold their breath for 15 minutes. Tumors move. Previously, the, the radiation beam did not used to move. So the tumor would move, radiation beam would not move, so you would burn more of the lung. But now we have technology where the, the, the radiation beam moves along with the lung. And that's what IGRT is. It further reduces the side effects. And we used to poison people also. We still poison them a lot. We give chemotherapy. But there are newer chemotherapies. There are better chemotherapies. Our supportive care has gotten significantly better. Modern chemotherapies for lung cancer has very, very few side effects in general, provided you choose your patients and your chemotherapies properly. So, the old joke still stands. We, we still mutilate, we still um, burn, we still poison, but it's no longer the way the old age was. They're all significantly improved now. We have improved outcomes. But improving outcomes doesn't mean that we're curing uh, all that many more people. Ultimately, we want to be able to cure more and more people. If we cannot cure, we at least want to make people live much longer with a better quality of life. So the other than the old three <coughs> modalities that have been around for more than 60 or 100 years now, radiation and surgery have been there for 100 years or more, um, we, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, came up with an entirely novel class of agents called targeted therapies. All of you have heard of it by now. Those of you who are going to exams, this will turn up your exam also. Remember, examiners like to ask, if at all you get asked about malignancies, they like to ask you about the more modern advances. Targeted therapies are now pretty much well established in lung cancer. You find a specific target on a given cancer cell, and you try and hit that particular target. That way, you get to kill more cancer cells, and you um, have much fewer side effects. And uh, this is what is called personalized medicine. All of you know that cancers are the result of mutations. Mutations are always ca happening as cancer cells proliferate. New mutations grant survival advantages to the cancer cells. You try and find the driver mutation that is causing the cancer, and if you can hit that, then actually you're doing a much better service in killing cancer cells and uh, saving a lot of unpleasant side, side effects. Many of these target therapies are oral also. That's a pill that you take instead of injections, which is even better. So, so far, these are the targets that we know of. These are all cell surface receptor targets. Um, the vast majority are still unknown. 45% of targets are still unknown. We're still researching those. Keras is another common one. We still don't have a target for that. EGFR is very, very famous. All of you know we have targets for EGFR, the epidermal growth factor receptor. ALK, we have a target. ROS, we have a target. BRIEF, we have a target medicine. HER, we have a targeted medicine. MET, we have a targeted medicine. So as the years go on, we're finding more targets and we're inventing more medicines against those targets. And uh, the FDA recommended targets are these. This is what we typically test for in the modern age in advanced lung cancer. And look at the survivals. Median survivals for stage, these, all these are for stage four lung cancer, considered incurable. Median survivals for stage four lung cancer have been steadily increasing decade by decade because of all these advances. In 1980, 1990, stage four lung cancer, with the therapy existing then, if they lived for eight months, it was considered a very big achievement. Today, the median, median survivals are in excess of two to three years. What is median survival? My pin drop silence. We were never like this in our MBBS class. Why such a stunned pin drop silence? Somebody, tell me what is median survival. Quick. Sir. Average duration of survival. Um, close. So this is eighth class syllabus now. If all of us, all of us were awake in eighth class, you would remember this. Mean, median, average, three are different things. Remember? Remember mean, median, average? 
basic statistics is very important for all physicians. I think you really should make an effort to learn very basic statistics and this has a very practical implication because ultimately, see, you guys refer patients to us. All of you are general physicians, but more, most of you. Most of you are the primary care for most of these patients. You refer them to us. Once we counsel the patient, they'll go back to you and ask, doctor said he'll poison me or whatever is giving you all these fancy new medicines, what do you think? And you should know at least the basics of how to counsel the patient. Many people do come up with the idea, oh, I got two years to live. When we say median survival is two years, what does that mean? How would you counsel a patient? I'm your patient. I'd say, doctor, I have only two years to live. So what would you tell me? What would you tell me? Yeah, you have only two years to live. So I mark my calendar, my death day. I count two years from the time of diagnosis. Is the day I'm going to die? I actually had a patient who did that. He's an engineer. Somebody told him the median survival, and he marked his death day on the calendar. He actually survived it, and he was very disappointed he didn't die on that day. <laughs> <coughs> median survival is a statistical measure. It does not mean the patient is going to live for two years. If you take 100 people, 50% are to, going to be dead at two years, 50% are going to be alive at two years. That is what median is. It's a little different from average. Average is you add all the patient's numbers and you divide it by the number of patients. Mean is the job, geometric mean. Median means 50% are alive, 50% are dead. It is only a statistical measure that allows us to compare apples with apples. It does not mean that a given patient is going to live for two years. Please remember this. Do not go around telling people you have two years to live. You don't know. I have no idea how long I have to live. I have absolutely no clue how long the person in front of me is going to live. I can quote a statistic. If I take 100 people and treat them all with the same cancer, same parameters, and I treat them with this given this treatment, 50% are going to be dead at two years, 50% are going to be alive at two years. That means there are people who live for five years, six years, seven years. Unfortunately, there'll be people who are dead at one week also. So if you take the whole range, the median, the halfway point is two years, which is good compared to eight months just a decade or two ago. In this decade, we have come one more step forward, actually one more leap forward as a matter of fact. And in terms of personalized medicine in this day and age, we are in a position, especially in lung cancer, to personalize medicine. That means given cancer in a given patient. People used to wear, you know, it's like buying a t-shirt, one size fits all. Medium size fits everybody. Whether it's loose, whether it's tight, you have to wear a medium because you're approximately medium. Gone. We can now tailor make therapy for you, depending on what kind of markers, what kind of uh, mutations you are carrying. Everybody know the story of Othello? Have you heard of Othello? So it's a famous play by Shakespeare. And the villain, Othello, is a black man. He's the hero of the story. And the villain is a guy called Iago. In literature, Iago is called the most sophisticated villain in the entire literature. Why? <coughs> he didn't kill anybody. He made other people kill. So the whole story is about how Iago takes revenge on Othello by working on his mind and making Othello kill his wife. It's a tragedy. And Iago is guiltless in this because he didn't kill anyone. He just makes Othello kill it. So we are becoming more sophisticated too in cancer medicine. So we are inventing medicines now which don't kill the cancer cells. They will make your immune system kill it. So we have an entirely new class of medicines now called immunotherapies. It's a class. It's not any one drug. It's a class of medicines. What these medicines do is they do not, like Iago, they do not kill the cancer cells themselves. They stimulate your immune system so that your own immune cells will end up killing the cancer cells. Today, I'll talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are a group of medicines that, is a, that, is, that belong to the class of immunotherapies, and this is how they act. All of you know T cells. Yes? Don't be so dull, at least say yes. Yes. Or no, yes, well, thank you very much. I'm glad you know T cells. So we have B cells and T cells. You know that we have something called a T cell immunity, and this is how a typical T cell acts. You have a T cell receptor. Everybody can see that? You have a T cell receptor, the one at the bottom. And when this is stimulated by an antigen with the MHC, with the major histocompatibility complex, 
the T cell recognizes that antigen as foreign, then it is activated and it kills the um, foreign cell. Yes? Everything in our body has an accelerator and a brake. T cells also have brakes so that they don't get overexcited and start killing everything at random. They have a brake. What is the brake called? It's called PD1. Can you see that? So, programmed death receptor 1. This is the brake on the T cell. If the T cell receptor is the accelerator that stimulates the T cell and makes it kill the foreign cell, PD1 is the brake. This is how the body normally balances the action by applying an accelerator, applying a brake, balances the action of an activated T cell. Now, many tumors, not just lung cancer cells, many, many cancer cells, strictly speaking, cancer cells are, are foreign cells, right? They started in our own body, but they have mutated so much that they've stopped resembling any of the normal cells in our body. So normally, our immune system should be able to recognize these tumor cells and kill them, correct? Which happens in the majority of us. People don't realize that as the cells in our body are mutating, we are creating cancer cells all the time at random or because of certain exposures like tobacco, blah, blah, what, what not. In a lot of us, our tumor surveillance is so good that our tumor cell, that our T cell um, mechanisms are recognizing these tumor cells as foreign and killing them. Okay? But many cancers, what, they, what do they do? They actually mutate to develop a radar jamma. See that protrusion over there? So that's a protein that they express on their cell surface that jams PD-1. In other words, it will start stimulating the PD-1, which inhibits the activated T cell. So the T cell will recognize the antigen of the tumor cell as foreign and will start to kill it. But because the tumor cell has developed this, what is called the PDL one this PDL one is the radar jammer, more or less. It will block PDL one inhibit the T cell. That's how the tumor will escape death. This is clear? And PD is programmed death receptor one. PDL1 is programmed death receptor ligand 1. You don't have to remember all that, just remember PD1 and PDL1. PD, PD1 is the inhibitor on the T cell, PDL1 is a radar jammer on the tumor cell. And this is how a lot of tumors escape T cell surveillance. They escape our immunity and they're able to thrive at will. So, what do we do? What do we do? Quite simple, no? So, you block either PDL1 or PD1, either one of the two. Yes? So we can create a monoclonal antibody that will block either PDL1 or PD1, which means you have jammed the radar jammer. You have removed the radar jammer jamming from the from the from the tumor cell. Now the activated T cell has no longer any inhibition. It recognizes the tumor cell as foreign, tumor cell is dead. Yes? Clear? And that's what immune check, in, uh, checkpoint inhibitors do. So we have several drugs now which either are monoclonal antibodies, which either block the PDL1 or they block the PD1. Usually these are manufactured monoclonal antibodies, uh, engineered uh, chimeric uh, uh, an, an antibodies. Uh, one called Durval Durvalumab is completely humanized. And uh, by blocking PDL1 or PD1, they let the activated T cells recognize the tumor cells and start tumor killing. So one of the uh, medicine studied is PDL1 inhibitor Durvalumab in stage three lung cancer. Stage three lung cancers, if they can be operated, which is very very few unfortunately, should be operated. Operations are standard of care wherever the patient is resectable and operable. If you cannot operate, that means unresectable stage three lung cancer, either medically inoperable or surgically unresectable. Standard of care right now is giving chemotherapy and radiation. So as, like I said, in stage three, chemotherapy and radiation still stands, uh, preferably with the modern techniques. Even with that, it's only a small minority who live long. Majority are not cured, even with chemotherapy and radiation. After chemotherapy and radiation, by adding Durvalumab, given once every three weeks for a total of one year, typically. 
people tend to live longer, cancer is delayed significantly, response rates are almost double that of chemotherapy, or double that of placebo, serious side effects are approximately the same, 30%, 26% marginal difference. So it's reasonably well tolerated, side effects are not really different from placebo, and it's quite effective in making people live longer, making people, delaying the cancer from coming back. Now, what do you think the side effects could be? It's common sense, right? Finding this deadly side effects, say something, no? What do you think the side effects could be? You are activating T cells. What do you think the side effects could be? Killing of host cells. Sorry? Killing of host cells. Okay, ghost cells. That's theoretical. In practice, that doesn't happen so much. What else? Killing of own cells. Killing of your own cells. Autoimmune phenomena are the most common side effects with these medicines. You're right. It's common sense, right? If you are activating T, say, we said the T cells has a brake and an accelerator. If you are jamming the brakes, then it will have only an accelerator. What do you think will happen? It won't kill just tumor cells. It will start killing your own cells too. So autoimmune phenomena are quite common. You could have thyroiditis, you could have colitis, you could have uh, uh, skin toxicity, you could have suppression of the um, cortical axis, uh, the cortisone axis, you could have pneumonitis also, you could have autoimmune lung disease also. Mm -hmm. Typically, these are manageable with steroids. So what we do in the clinic is when we give these medicines, we monitor very closely and depending on the kind of autoimmune toxicity that have, we have to monitor for this closely. When we monitor and we detect any autoimmune phenomena by adjusting with the proper dose of steroids, steroids are the brakes that we apply on the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So between immune checkpoint inhibitor dosing and steroids, side effects can be kept up very, very low and we do have significant activity from these medicines. Now, this is a Kaplan-Meier plot showing the progression-free survival. What's a Kaplan-Meier plot? Again, basic statistics. Sorry to harp on this, but I, I think it's important for everybody to know a Kaplan-Meier plot. Anyone? It's there. You can read and tell. You can cheat. Cheating is an excellent way of remembering things. It's a graph. If, you, if you're doing a study, especially a comparative study, you draw a graph of time on x-axis and number of uh, patients on the y-axis. <coughs> yes? This is the graph you wait. So if you begin with 100 patients, that 100%, right? You begin with 100. Time zero. Time zero, you begin with 100 patients. <coughs> yes? Now you're treating them. And you're following them over time. And the graph tells you how many people are <coughs> progressing. Progression-free survival means, progression-free survival means the number of people that are progressing on their cancers, those who are not stable, whose cancers are starting to grow or they're having some other unfortunate event, <coughs> okay? So if you begin with 100, the orange line is a Durval map line, that is an experimental line, and the red line is the placebo line. So see the gap between the two. In other words, you began with 100 as time goes on, people with Durval map are progressing much less, yes? And the people with, uh, in the placebo are progressing much less. So the median PFS is 50%. We just said that wrong. This is 50%. <coughs> this is the median PFS of the placebo, about five and a half months. This is the median, same 50% for Durval map is about 18 months. So this is what median PFS or median survival means. The time point at which 50 have progressed, 50 have not progressed. So it's five and a half months versus 18 months. Statistically, that is very, very significant. You got an extra year that the cancer has not progressed. Ultimately, what also matters is the tail. As you continue monitoring, look at the tail, it's widening. That means these are the patients, this gap, are the patients who have really hard hit the jackpot. They are continuing, it's, it's flattened. They're continuing not to progress. This is clear? So it's not just the median survival. Looking at the plot, Kaplan-Meier plot tells you a lot of other things. 
for example, how many are continue to flat out and how many are ultimately benefiting in the end. So there's a significant uh, majority who are actually not progressing even in the long term. kaplan my plot works for any statistical analysis of any intervention, not just cancer, in cardiology, in nephrology, in neurology, any new drug you have, you've got to look at the basic statistics because it's your job to analyze a study, a published study, and apply it to the patient in front of you. Yes? Same plot for overall survival. Gap is not that different. The reason being, those people who progress on uh, any drug are going to be treated anyway. But still, there is a survival advantage as well in stage three. Pembrolizumab is another very, very commonly used uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor now. It is a PD-1 inhibitor, not a pd one inhibitor. And uh, randomized study in stage four lung cancer compared with chemotherapies. That means pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy alone significant survival advantage. People actually are living longer with just pembrolizumab rather than with chemotherapy. And the only caveat here is, for these people, we actually measure the amount of PDL1 that they're expressing. Remember, we said tumor cells do express this PDL1 receptor, which is the radar jammer, remember? So you can test for that. You can do a simple IFC. There's a standardized immunohistochemistry test and you can stain the cells and you can, you can count the percentage of cells that are expressing the pdl one So if you're more than 50% of pdl one expression in the tumor, that means uh, your pembrolizumab is going to work very, very well in those patients. Response rates are significantly higher than chemotherapy. Toxicity is actually less than chemotherapy, 26% versus 50, 53%, so half the toxicity of chemotherapy. And that's a kaplan meyer plot for the pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy. They've even tried pembrolizumab along with chemotherapy in stage four lung cancer, and that still seems to work even better. Even this prolonged survive significantly, uh, reasonable toxicity, response rates are almost doubled. And that's a, that's a plot for the combination, pembrolizumab chemotherapy and the placebo chemotherapy along. So in summary, if you have stage three lung cancer and it is unresectable, the standard of care, if the patient can tolerate it and is willing to do it, is combined radiation chemotherapy. So you give radiation, preferably one of the more modern techniques like IGRT, and you give chemotherapy along with it. Chemotherapy works best when you give it along with chemotherapy, not before or after radiation, followed by immune checkpoint inhibitor for about one, one, one year. And the approved immune checkpoint inhibitor in this situation is the map for now. If you have stage four lung cancer, then histopathology matters. Histology actually matters. There was a time when we said histology doesn't matter, squamous, non-squamous, small cell, non-small cell. Remember, all your textbooks will say the same thing. Small cell or non-small cell mattered. In non-small cell, it did not matter. Now we know that in non-small cell, squamous, non-squamous matters. We treat them a little differently. So if the stage four lung cancer is squamous, you still can consider an immune checkpoint inhibitor and chemotherapy, provided the PDL1 is expression is high. This still beats chemotherapy alone, but only by a marginal advantage. The advantage of immune check, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in squamous is not is there, but it is not as great as it is in non-squamous. So, if the patient for any reason is not willing to do it, you can go with just chemotherapy alone. And the chemotherapy is a little different. We use either taxane or we use gemcitabine with platinum. If it is non-squamous, first thing we do is we check for these four markers. EGFR, ALP, ROS, BRAF. I get several referrals with lung cancer and uh, very well-read, very informed primary care physicians or the pulmonologists. They already do some of this testing on the lung cancer and then send the patient to me with the results. And uh, they're doing a good thing because they're cutting time short and they're making sure that when the, um, the biopsy happens, that the markers are already done. But typically, majority do only EGFR and ARC because that's been around for about five years. We miss the ROS, BRAF, and PDL1. It is important to do actually all five EGFR, ARC, ROS, BRAF, and PDL1. Ideally, you should do it in sequence. Although in India, we generally tend to do it together because of time factor, because the turnaround time is a little high. Nobody wants to wait long when the lung cancer is diagnosed. 
and the testing is not all that expensive, we typically do it together. But ideally, you don't have to do it all together. You can do the EGFR. If it is negative, you do the R cross and graph. And if they are negative, then you do the PVL one. That is a sequence in which they are ideally tested, time permitting. If you have EGFR, we have an entire host of TKS now, Jeftinib uh, and all that, you know that. ALK, ROS, or BRAF, Crizotinib, or Vemurafenib. So we have targeted therapies if these mutations are present. If they are absent, you do the PDL1. If it is more than 50% on the standard IHC testing, then immune checkpoint inhibitor plus chemotherapy is now the standard of care. It beats chemotherapy alone. Only if all of these are negative, then you consider chemotherapy. The modern chemotherapy for non squamous lung cancer is pemetrexate and carboplatin, stage 4. Very, very, very well tolerated, very limited side effects, and it works fairly well in making people live significantly longer. So this, in summary, is you have you treat unresectable advanced lung cancer in this day and age. Question always comes. All of these things are very, very expensive. How, how, how far does it apply to our country? It is a challenge, of course. It's a challenge in Western countries. It's a bigger challenge in our countries. Um, each one has their own viewpoint, but ultimately, two things. Number one, the guy who's paying, whether that be the patient or the insurance company or the state, has to decide how much they are paying and what they're getting for it. So it becomes a payer's decision, really, of the, the amount of. This is what you're going to buy. Is it worth it to you or not is something that the buyer has to decide. Second thing is, as time goes on, all these technologies are dramatic and they're very, very expensive today. But as time goes on, remember, they'll get dramatically cheaper. When the targeted uh, kinase inhibitors, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors came about five or six years ago, many people couldn't afford it. One month's course costed almost one lakh. Now you can get it for 10,000 or even less. So. As time goes on, these things become cheaper and more and more people uh, will be able to benefit from them. So I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.